Les Blomberg, the Executive Director of the Noise Pollution Clearinghouse in Montpelier. This is uh, slide one we're looking at right now. We can go to slide two. Um, I wanted to talk today about a paper that was presented, and it's already been discussed here today, which was the uh, um, Wind Turbine Health Impact Study that was done by the state of Massachusetts that was discussed earlier. This paper that I'm presenting here, or uh, it's not my paper, it was a presentation I was at in San Francisco uh, about nine months ago. And it is, uh, I think, very important and very helpful in understanding um, your role and um, the, the pitfalls of undertaking your task uh, you know, that you have set for yourself. Um, the author who presented this is Dr. Paul Schomer. He's one of the preeminent acousticians in our country with 35 to 40 years of experience. He's the chair of the American National Standards Institute um, Noise Committee, um, also the representative to the ISO Noise Committee from the United States. Um, slide three, please. Um, and this is the uh, paper that he critiqued, um, Wind Turbine Health Impact Study, Report of Independent Expert Panel. Uh, that was slide three, now slide four, please. What I want you to come away with is the image of this is a red flag. Whenever you hear the Massachusetts study, I, would, I want this image to pop up in your mind. And Paul's paper, which I gave you a copy of, and I've highlighted a number of sections of, um, describes that. It is also a cautionary tale for the Public Service Board in going forward, because I think it's critical that you not make the same mistakes that they did. And I, I think that being aware of them would be very helpful in not doing that. Slide five, please. Um, Dr. Schomer reports a couple problems with the um, central issues of that Massachusetts study. The two of them being infrastructure, its, its treatment of infrasound and low frequency noise, and its assessment of health impacts and annoyance. And when you think about it, those are kind of two of the big issues that you guys are wondering about. What, 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 what is the contribution of low frequency noise? Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? And what are the health impacts? And this study had significant flaws with both of those. <laughs> Uh, slide six, please. You, uh, I gave you all a uh, copy of the paper. I also gave a copy of the paper to the board so that it can be presented on your website. Um, it is um, highlighted, and I'm going to take you through those. I'm going to begin with the very last page and the conclusions. And just read the two main problems there at the bottom of the arrow. The authors of the Massachusetts study show problems with their analysis at many points, such as by selectively quoting evidence in a reference when the majority of the reference is contrary to the major thesis of the Massachusetts study. That was number one. Second major one, a perfect survey is impossible to create from a practical standpoint. But that seems to be the only evidence satisfactory to the author for establishing a relationship between wind turbine noise and annoyance. This is an issue we've heard before. What type of study would qualify? And Dr. Schomer looked carefully at that, and I would like to take you through that. Um, so slide seven, please. Here again, this is the very introduction, the beginning of this paper on the first page. Um, you see where the, there's a letter A and B. A rep represents the, uh, the quality of analysis of the physical wind turbine noise. And, and here he's talking about the low frequency and infrasound. And B is the quality of analysis that the Massachusetts report did on the literature with re human response. And that was the second issue, the health and annoyance issue. Slide eight, please. Um, the Massachusetts study, reading uh, from point two there, in several places used 
as its foundation the fact, in quotes, that wind turbines do not produce significant infrasonic sound. Rather, they produce high frequency sound modulated at the blade pass frequency. They cite for this two papers, right? Again, that's quoted. Amplitude modulation in wind turbine noise has been discussed at length by two authors. I'm going to look at the first of those authors, Vandenberg, and his paper. Slide nine, please. The Massachusetts study attributes the following to Vandenberg. Amplitude modulation is the cause of the whooshing sound, referred to as the swish swish by Vandenberg, that sometimes becomes the thumping sound. That's from the Massachusetts study. Amplitude modulation, for those who aren't familiar, as opposed to a low frequency sound, if we're talking about a one hertz sound, a one hertz wavelength would be very loud, or very long, and um, very low frequency, where amplitude modulation might be a broadband sound, a, uh, a type of sound maybe, but it would be um, pulsating or peaking at a frequency of like that one, that same one second. So it would be more like shh, 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 something more similar to that. Um, so the, the problem is, is that that Vandenberg paper never mentioned amplitude modulation. The Massachusetts study ignores the major findings of the Vandenberg paper and appears to be contrary to the findings, that appear to be contrary to the findings of the Massachusetts study. That's that second quote on that page. Page nine, please. Or, or page 10, please. That was page nine on the screen. The second issue that Dr. Schomer looked at was human response. Here, like some of the people who presented before, they present a history or you know, a, a, a search of the literature, but it appears to find something wrong with every study that has been done. Dr. Schomer, in this paper, notes a number of the problems with saying that. And the, the problem is basically that that is not the state of the art in acoustic measurement, in acoustic studies. Page 11, please. The Massachusetts study authors make much of the fact that surveys are cross-sectional rather than longitudinal, attacking several of what they, uh, of what we are just a few studies with this argument. Uh, the only way for these studies to have been longitudinal and to demonstrate that the annoyance was due to noise and not to attitude to the wind turbines is for the studies to have been begun long before the turbines were announced as a possibility. Basically, the criteria that a number of people before me have suggested is that you have to do, in order for a study to count, it has to have started before anybody knew a wind turbine could be cited there. That study's not going to happen. It's going to be very, very rare and lucky if it does. It is a criteria that is impossible to meet. Going on, the next quote. There are hundreds of referee papers on cross-sectional studies or surveys in acoustics. The experts in the mass study knew or should have known that this is the state of the art in acoustics. In that paragraph above, they cite nearly 100 aviation, military, roadway noise studies that were done in English. And he notes only one that was a longitudinal study. The rest are cross-sectional studies. That is what is done. But what, they, what, what, what we've heard today is that's not good enough. Okay, problem is, that's what you got. Okay, that's what there is. Okay. Um, that was slide 11. I would like to go to slide 12, please. 
There was another problem uh, noted in the, that, that the mass study noted, which was the lack of data. They said that the um, peer-reviewed studies had had a lack of data. And um, you can see right down there, the, the claim at the bottom. If we go to slide 13, Dr. Schirmer's response um, was that, you know, a lot of these, <laughs> one of the criteria for a lot of these journals, when they are being reviewed, is that they be concise, and that not every piece of data be included. And so again, we have a case of the Massachusetts study finding fault with kind of the state of the art of academic papers, and not seriously examining the material in them because they found a reason to exclude that and not consider that. Slide 14, please. Again, I want to go back to that red flag theme. That Massachusetts study should raise a huge red flag. It misrepresented its sources, and it presented unrealistic criteria that cannot be met. And I also want to note this as, as, a, as a, a, a warning to, to you, in the sense that um, make sure that if you do set a criteria threshold for your data and your information, that it can be met. Because otherwise, we, we're going to spend, you know, we will know the answer to these questions in 20 or 30 years, but we won't know them to the certainty until, or until then. But we will have really good indications long before that. And you may have to make decisions based on the really good indications. Thank you very much. Thank you.